let's talk about the legislation. So in the United Kingdom, it's the uh, Online Safety Bill, and in the EU, the Digital Service Act that actually uh, put pressure on digital platforms to, among other things, filter out hate speech and filter out misinformation, right? Um, can you talk about that? Yeah, sure. Um, well, uh, let's start with the, in, in the UK, the online safety bill, um, which uh, is a, about to become law. It's not law yet, but it's going to receive royal assent um, very soon, and then it will become law. And it's a very big piece of legislation. And I think it's, to me, it's terrifyingly vague. No one knows really um what it means in practice um but let me just give you a little example of what it says so part 10 communications offenses uh, a person commits an offense this is a criminal offense if a person sends another person a message and that message conveys information that the person knows to be false and the person has no reasonable excuse for sending the message. Now, it's important to understand. It's not just, you know, someone sending a text to someone else. When they define message, this means anything, any type of communication um, that's online. So this would affect um, search engines. They're sending messages. It's not just individuals. And of course, um, online providers, whether that's X or Facebook or Rumble or YouTube or anyone, anyone sending a message is committing an offence if there's information that's false in it. Now, the next, this is quite incredible. Wait, 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 wait just for a second. Does yeah. this mean that this passage in that bill actually criminalizes lying? Because we are usually we are usually allowed in everyday life to lie. This is not something that government said you are not allowed to do unless you're under oath. I mean, if I want to tell an untruth, it is until now, it has been my right to tell an untruth. But if I do this online in the UK, I am I am criminally liable. Yeah, well, it's worse wow. than that. It, it, I mean, it doesn't use the word lying, although, I mean, this, this is the problem. This hasn't been tested in the courts. And there's... Um, you know, no one knows what it means. It, it, it's horribly vague, terrifyingly vague. But yes, it, yes, it does criminalize lying. It criminalizes um, anyone sending any type of communication to anyone that they know to be false. Well, how do we know they know that it's false? And what is, you know, who gets to decide what's false? We'll talk and about even that if just they a... know, why would that be a? I mean, why is a crime? I mean, lying is lying, but it has not been a crime so far, unless you're under oath. Well, I, I, as I keep saying, it's much it's much worse than than this because it doesn't distinguish anywhere in here between a fact and an opinion. We, mm -hmm. could, we could talk about this in just a minute, um, because if you this again is something I talk about at length in the book, Truthophobia, and the way that you know Victorian liberal journalism was very very. Um, uh, very very strict about the distinction between facts and opinions um and it, it was what i call boomer journalism modern journalism has really erased that distinction and led to a, a situation where we just have narratives which are either ethically politically good or ethically politically bad but look we digress let's get back to the um online safety bill um the very next section this is section 181 which follows section 180 this lists ex um, exemptions from offences. OK, so these people are going to be exempt from that law. A recognised news publisher <laughs> cannot cannot commit an offence under Section 180. So, th I mean, this is quite astonishing, isn't it? Because what I write about in my book and what I'm sure a lot of your listeners mm. will be aware of is this distinction between what I call it official journalism and unofficial journalism. You, Pascal, are unofficial journalism, the BBC, and they're, speci they're specifically exempt in Section 56, a recognised news publisher. And it says the BBC, and it has a whole list, a whole wait, list wait. of, of definitions. <laughs> The BBC and recognised news publishers are officially allowed to say untruths, knowing that yes. they're not true. Knowing Correct. that they're not true. 
Yeah, rec- wow. section 56, a recognized news publisher uh, is, is part 1A, and the example is the British Broadcasting Corporation. And there's a whole whole load of other um, examples. But what they're trying to do is, is what I write about in the book, is, is this distinction between official journalism, what a lot of people call mainstream, the mainstream media, they, they're exempt. And unofficial journalism, you, Pascal, and hundreds and indeed thousands of bloggers, which are um, sources of uh, alternative opinions, uh, alternative facts, which are done by responsible, educated, intelligent people, um, that's potentially criminal. So, for example, if you're in the UK, do you have, this is section C, do you have Pascal for your YouTube channel? Do you have a standards code? Show me your standards code, Pascal. No, you haven't got one. Well, you're in trouble. <laughs> Well, you're in trouble then, because there's a whole list here of, of you know, they're, they're trying to define um, what um, in a kind of official journalism is. But there's there's one other thing, you know, which I think is really important. I've not seen this publicized anywhere, but Section 7 um, of, of, of the bill sets up, it gives huge powers to Ofcom, which is the regulator in the UK, and it tells Ofcom they've got to set up immediately a new advisory committee on disinformation and misinformation. Now, that's that's fascinating. And it's something also that the EU Digital Services Act does, because that is all Orwell's Ministry of Truth. Ofcom are going to be told to set up a new committee to basically advise and rule on what is true and what is false. And what is what is legal and what is illegal, and um, yeah, it's quite terrifying, isn't it? You know, we're going to have it's very terrifying. This is, I mean, we are going down the drains very, very, very fast here, and I've, I've just, I didn't think it will come this quickly. Uh, this is, this is, this is extremely scary. We now are. I mean, as soon as this is law, any blogger any youtuber is under constant danger of being singled out as a spreader of misinformation and if 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 in a court he's accused or she's accused of doing so knowingly then that's it you're behind bars or whatever it is yeah well there are huge financial penalties um and um ofcom is also i think you know may have the the, the power to block certain channels and so on if 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 necessary um but what interests me and this is something again i write about in the book truth of phobia is you know, what is truth and the way truth changed um by truth what i'm talking about is is journalistic truth or um the idea of legitimate knowledge um and it used to be with the enlightenment the idea was you couldn't possibly know the truth unless you heard both sides that they would have laughed, the Victorians would have laughed and they would have been, I think, horrified to see what we're doing now because they would have said, you can't know what's false. John Stuart Mill would have would have roared with laughter. He, he would have said, you can't know what's true or false unless you hear both sides of the argument, unless you hear the evidence for and against. And it's for individuals to make up their minds. And the Victorians would have stressed, well, what's a fact and what's opinion? The act doesn't distinguish. It just says, you know, a, a communication that's false. Well, if if you have an opinion about something, is that now going to be criminalized? It sounds like it is. Opinions are going to be true or false, perhaps. But, it, you know, it's it's the vagueness. We don't know how this is going to play out, Pascal. Um, I'm not trying to be overly alarmist, but I think if you give huge sweeping powers to the state it, it his, history tells yeah. us it doesn't end well yeah and especially if you then if the only institutions that are exempt from this rule are the ones that we know that lied to us several times in the past when it really mattered i just recall everybody that the uk was buddy buddy side by side with uh with the united states to attack iraq 
and do a horrible war, a horrible war, you know, a really, really disgusting war. And that the same was then true again with Libya. You know, this is where my international relations spiel comes in, right? And the newspapers have been at the forefront of all of this warmongering and also of the of the fear mongering, right? And of the whole, um, even the Russia gating and so on. And these were horrible, big untruths. And these institutions themselves that have been pivotal in the past to guide public opinion in order to allow most horrible like state power, the power to make war, to be exercised. Those are the ones that are excluded from the, the from having to be truthful. I it does it can I, I don't think it can get any more uh, uh, Orwellian at this point. Oh, I think it can, uh, and really? I I fear that it will. I know you wanted me to mention the um, the, the EU, the, the no, European no, equivalent, which is the hmm. Digital Services Act, and um, uh, I, I won't go into the detail of it. But they they they're perhaps targeting what they refer to as a very large online platform. So it, it would appear that that piece of legislation is particularly geared towards X, Elon Musk's X platform, or Facebook, or YouTube. Those big platforms appear to be uh, what they're targeting and they um talk in the um in the digital services act as 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 um they recognize what they refer to as trusted flaggers and it is they're going to be the role of trusted flaggers to flag up what is hateful what is misinformation what is disinformation so it's very very much the same isn't it if we look suddenly we see it's it's almost a parallel with the um UK legislation where Ofcom has got to set itself up as a committee to rule on what is true. Well, we're getting that and the going to get that in, in, in European countries. The trusted flaggers will be the arbiters of what is true and what is false. Um, and uh, online providers, let's say X, will be told you've got to block uh, material that's hateful um, or disinformation. Who gets to decide? Well, the, the trusted flaggers will decide um and it's very it's very weird all of this is happening at the same time isn't it and i i also came Please. across this um i pulled this off uh the internet this is from the united nations from this this year um information integrity on digital platforms our common agenda policy brief number eight from the from the united nations um and so this is current as well and it talks about this concept uh, of information integrity. And they say information integrity refers to the accuracy, consistency, and reliability of information. It is threatened by disinformation, misinformation, and hate speech. And it says there is no universally accepted definitions of these terms, but UN entities are developing working definitions. So it's the same thing. It's the same thing. It's saying that, you know, speech we don't want, you know, we're going to label it misinformation, disinformation and hate speech. And the UN there is saying, you know, um, you know, these things are not uh, universally understood. There's a great quote, great quote, slightly, slightly disturbing quote, perhaps right, right, right at the end of it. Um, and it says the era of Silicon Valley's move fast and break things philosophy must be brought to a close. It is essential that safety by design is integrated into all new technologies and products at the outset. So um, again, we've got the same thing. We've got this kind of vagueness um, and we've got a desire to impose forms of censorship. Um, and we've seen censorship before historically. And, um, that's the way I see it, Pascal. It, to, to me, it's something is ending and we're actually going back to a, a dark period of history. I've got a couple of other things I'll, just to just to read out to you. Just, this is from the year 1662 um, when Charles II introduced censorship in England and he required all printed materials to be licensed. And uh, of course, it's, it's always the same language. It's done for safety. Mm -hmm. It's done to protect people, protect them Dude, from themselves. The child, the little imbecile who's not able to form a correct opinion without it being 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 stamped. The little, the, the kid, the child. 
right it's you, too dangerous it's too dangerous for you to know and this is what charles ii said in 1662 the, this was his act of parliament many evil disposed persons have been encouraged to print and sell heretical schismatical blasphemous seditious and treasonable books pamphlets and papers and censorship was introduced to um to ban any doctrine or opinion contrary to the official doctrine of the church or the government so it was the the same thing and um it's always done it's always sold to us that this is to keep us safe and protect us i've got one more this is a quiz this is a new thing for your youtube uh viewers and and for you pascal this is a quiz question i'm going to read you a very short couple of sentences this is from a piece of legislation which was introduced to protect people from hate speech and it was to regulate journalism i want you to tell me and your listeners can guess tell me where this was from quote editors must treat their subjects truthfully editors must keep out of the newspapers anything which is misleading offends the religious sentiments of others or offends a person's welfare harms their reputation or makes them appear ridiculous or contemptible unquote where's that from monty python sorry monty python no um i mean it's it's phrased isn't it it sounds very kind it, and phrased it's, it's um, a... section th it's section 13 of the editorial law introduced by Adolf Hitler's Nazi Germany on the 4th of oh. October, 1933. But well done. The language, well done. Is all, the language is always the same. We're here to protect you. But once you give power um, to people in authority, power, as Lord Acton famously said, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. We don't know how this is going to play out, Pascal. Um, you no, know, it, I'm sure there'll be another voice. Someone would object to what I'm saying and say, you know, you're you're an alarmist. You know, this is this is actually it's okay. But we don't know how this is going to play out. But we're giving tremendous power to to our our rulers, and um, I see the future with with some foreboding. No, the only way that this can play out without tears is if it's struck down by the courts. That's the I don't see another another way. If this is law and if this is going to be the, the rule from now on, uh as you, you correctly, you just very correctly uh made analogies between this current language of that uh, of these of these two laws in Britain and in the EU uh, with with acts of six, uh, 1662 in the in, in the UK uh under under the monarchy and and even with 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 uh, Nazi Germany this is this is a correct analogy and be, and what these things do is they don't keep us the citizens safe they keep the government safe from us they keep they they keep the ruling class safe and comfortable because they're the ones who get to decide to decide what trickles tickles down to the peasants and what doesn't so the peasants don't take the forks and actually demand something that they have a right to um and i'm not i'm not advocating for violence i mean the only thing we can do is non-violent uh, uh protest against this never ever do violence because you lose the second you start it um of course, but of course um, because otherwise this is already hate speech, right? And would, would have to be banned. And I'm I'm afraid because YouTube now and, and the others and so on, you know, this uh, by by now it's enough to have an allegation in order to be already deemed to have transgressed and then be uh, be outcasted. Um Graham, you have a, you have experience in, 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 in journalism and, and in the UK. This is new, right? This is this is not something that just, you know, has been there 15, 20 years ago. We just didn't notice. And now it just got a new name. This is actually a new development, isn't it? Well, it's completely new. Yeah. I mean, I think um, um, as someone who worked in British journalism, you know, we were always very proud of the fact we were free 
uh, free to say whatever we like. There was there was growing self censorship, you know. Um, but um, no, I I think it is sad. You know, when I was um, a child, my uh, my mother took me to Speakers Corner in London. I don't know if you you're, you're familiar with that or your your um, viewers are familiar. It's a little um, tiny little um, square near um, uh, Marble Arch in central London. And, and Speaker's Corner was this place where anyone could say anything. Crazy people, um, and there were crazy people standing on soapboxes. Uh, there were all sorts of people, so people saying some pretty horrible, offensive things, actually. Uh, but my mum took me there and she said, you know, this is this kind of sums up the thing that's great about um, England and America and other kind of Western democracies is you can you can say anything. It's just just speech. And you can argue, you could go to Speaker's Corner, and you could argue with these people. Um, and it seems we're, we're just we're, we're, we're just moving away from this idea. We just want to be protected and the state wants to protect us. And uh, we're moving away from the idea of liberty. And, you know, John Stuart Mill, the great Victorian liberal philosopher, um, who argued for freedom of speech and freedom of um, conscience, um, he 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 asked rhetorically because people would say, "But yeah, but if you have free speech, you will allow um, you know hateful people people to say evil evil things and encourage evil deeds." You know, so she, so isn't isn't there a case for censorship? And his reply to that, which I can't improve upon, um, was, "Yes, you will get that." You will get evil people um, spreading lies, trying to incite people to do evil things. He admitted that. But he said it's better. It's the, the lesser of two evils. It's better to have that as a cost um, to living in a free society rather than the alternative, which is potentially you're going to live in a totalitarian society, which does not tolerate dissent and where only a single view a single opinion is tolerated um and all the all the the eras of human flourishing throughout history have coincided with these brief periods of liberty where we can say what we want and yeah there are costs to it yeah it's not all easy and you know uh, utopian free, free ha having a living in a world where there's free speech is is pretty damn tough because you will get massive disagreements and you will get people saying hateful and offensive things but the answer is to go down the route that we're going down to to go down this road towards what seems to be totalitarian censorship is the wrong the wrong solution the solution is worse than the disease the remedy is worse than the problem I wish we could end on a happier note, but I completely agree. And I think it's, um, I think we're going down a dangerous path. Graham Majin, thank you very much for your, uh, for your input.